I think in many ways it, it says how ambitious the North has been. It's just a very powerful, simple, bold statement of civic pride and unity. It's very much saying we can be positive, we can be dynamic and forward-thinking about our industrial future, about our economic future, about concentrating on uh, art and design and culture. And that post-war optimism really shines through in the Tyne Deck. It was about, you know, modernism really came into its own because they could see there was a way of creating a bright new Future. The whole concept of the Tyne Deck was something that I knew nothing about until uh, I got invited to, to contribute to Idea of the North. But also I've always been obsessed with the idea of past architectural visions of the future in a way, and th especially things that haven't um, came to pass. And the Tyne Deck was so daring and different. I, I never thought this would see the light of day again. And I think it's fascinating just sort of seeing people's reactions now to um, you know, something that I thought was dead and buried, you know, 40 years ago. When I first joined Ryder in the late 70s, there was a little model sitting in reception. It was the time deck, and no one ever spoke of it. It was never discussed. And at the time, I thought, what a crazy idea. Um, what were these guys on? You know, what was that about? Essentially, it's about concreting over the river, concreting over the, the river Tyne with a concrete deck that would enable you to walk out from the quayside into the middle of the river and then uh, encompass a series of uh, art and cultural establishments, uh, an opera house, a gallery, a theatre, uh, museums and restaurants. I think like Raider Yates, um, they went out to provoke a little bit. They wanted to get opinions, and the, the whole concept was kind of daring. But I think, however out there it seemed, it could have been a really positive thing because the actual, you know, the quayside was was dead in the water. Shall we say it was kind of it was it was rotting away, you know. I think it was designed to invite controversy. When you put post-industrial Tyneside into the context of the 70s, the river was neglected. It was. It was flanked on both sides by, you know, derelict industrial sheds. The city had turned its back on it. We still had the same issues politically between Gateshead and Newcastle as we have now, you know, divided two sides of the river. I think they just wanted to make a statement. It, and I think it was as much a political statement as it was an architectural statement there's a much more fundamental issue about what this proposal was trying to do and that is essentially trying to be a bridge, trying to bring two sides together, Gateshead and Newcastle, and think about a new use for the river. The ships were uh, gradually disappearing but we were on the cusp of change and that change was essentially we weren't going to see shipbuilding, we weren't going to export coal and so there had to be a new use for this incredible important watercourse. And Ryder and Yates came up with something radical which was essentially about looking forward to service sector, looking forward to art and culture and shops and commerce and retailing. Probably about 25 years before it actually hit the rest of Newcastle and indeed other cities. It was a time of big thinking. You know, we talk about the South Bank, for instance, in, in, in London, there were some big proposals around most of our cities. Um, and in some ways, it's a good thing that a lot of them weren't ever realised, but, you know, it was, it was a time of big thinking. Um, and so to say, let's put all the cultural buildings, let's put all of the civic buildings, um, slap bang in the middle of the river was a kind of a statement saying this is neutral. You know, this is about Newcastle and Gateshead. And, and I think that's what's really quite fascinating. The political debate about what happens outside the river is as lively now as it was probably livelier now than it was then, with lots of talk about unified authorities. And, you know, I think it's, it's fascinating the way new generations of seen this and responded in their own in their own very different ways. As a designer, a lot of the time you're kind of drawn to this aesthetic point of view straight away. So just seeing this vision of this kind of concrete deck across the time, I wanted something that could be an emblem in a way. This thing that would be universally recognised as 
the city of Tyneside, you know. That's why I based it on that kind of central building, you know. It's tapping into the, the idea of northern identity in the sense that the city of Tyneside, this idea of joining Newcastle and Gateshead together, just playing with the concept of the, um, the seahorse for Newcastle and the goat for Gateshead. Um, and, and try and make some specific, not a logo, but a kind of a coat of arms in a way. I think it is interesting to look back at where Gordon Ryder and Peter Yates came from. They got together as Ryder and Yates in 1953. Um, before that, Peter Yates had worked with Cabousier in Paris. They met through Berthold Lebetkin, they were recruited as part of the team to develop Peter Lee Newtown. Gordon and Peter came together and their architecture was then very committed modernism, totally inspired by Korb and Lebetkin. I think Ryder and Yates were letting their imaginations run riot to some extent in, in creating the form uh, that this, I mean, imagine um, uh, working with them at the time and them suddenly saying, we're going to concrete over the time. It would have provoked probably the same reaction as it does thinking about it today. There's no doubt about it that the time is precious to local people. It means something significant, partly because of its history and the, the, you know, the effort that went in from successive generations in using the river to further Britain's interests as much as anything else. But we don't actually use the river very effectively. And I just wonder whether it's so precious to people. It is so fixed in people's minds about its history and what it stood for that actually creating a new purpose of it, for it as a leisure destination is really jars against actually what it's done for Newcastle and, and the wider region. The idea that this concrete platform then is a new economic spirit for the city, a new economic purpose, but it stops large ships from going up the river it was almost the, the unpalatable element at the time uh, of the design being announced because it was saying, we turn now back on shipbuilding, we turn now back on the ships and we're using the water course for a very different purpose. Part of the thinking was to stop the tidal flow of the upper part of the tide so that it could be used constantly for recreational purposes and I think part of their thinking was let's get this river used and you know and you know if you did remove that tidal flow and kept it at high water level consistently what a transformation that would have been. It doesn't seem right you know to kind of take away the Tyne. The Tyne is such a beautiful river and what we're seeing now you know we've got the sage and we've got the Baltic and stuff in it it looks fantastic but at the time it was derelict you know so to have this sort of complete deck across the Tyne in a way it almost makes the Tyne Bridge which is this obviously cultural emblem a little bit redundant it just becomes another motorway in a way so I think that would have been controversial in itself the fact that there's helicopters flying around and stuff like that is so um, out there and fantastic and maybe you know the real people of Newcastle or you know pe people who had the money just I thought it was just too, it was too futuristic or it was too ahead of its time, you know, too daring. I don't think they ever expected anything to happen other than get people to think about the river. Then they wrote letters, we still have them on file, they wrote letters to everyone they can think of saying, please tell us what you think. The great Dan Smith, who thought, thought, said, bring it on. <laughs> and the Water Authority, the River Authority saying, yes, but we need to get battleships up the Tyne, you know, and we can't do that anymore if you build this thing. It's a provocation about the use of the river and the sort of quayside and the city we want to have in the future. And it was right, I suppose, that Ryder and Yates provoked an audience into thinking about what is the future of this region and where do we want to go? That was the critical issue. A lot of the stuff in the final piece, which is called A Northern Dream, is kind of based around the idea of helipads and kind of, um, you know, opera houses and performance and imagine if there had been a kind of a city of Tainsay ballet almost kind of make this fantastical dream of what it could have been. When we started talking about the exhibition and um, northernness we were thinking about optimistic visionary futures and putting that in the context of a lot of thinking now which um, is anything but and I think it was partly just a way of reminding ourselves that we can be visionary, you know, we can instigate change, we can get people to think differently about how and where we live. I mean, it's, it's odd, isn't it, to look back on something like that in order to get people to think differently about 
their futures, but I think that's what we hoped it would do, and I think that's, I'd like to think that's what it's doing. Everyone has an opinion on the place that they live and work and visit, and that's important to capture in some way. So something like this exhibition, if it enables the capturing of different opinions and perspectives about what it means to live and work here today and tomorrow, that can only be a good thing. My only reservation is, and question and provocation, is to what extent are politicians and professionals listening to that voice?